This is John Abrams, and this is The Variety Artist, episode 38. As I re-listen to this interview, I realize that every chapter in our life makes us what we are today. When she was a cocktail waitress at a blues club, did she know she'd become a belly dancer? When she became a belly dancer, did she know she'd travel the world and then become a jazz club owner and bouncer? When she was a jazz club owner and bouncer, did she know she'd become a speaker using her knowledge of body movement to empower women everywhere? Maybe not, but every step in her journey has made her the inspiring person she is today. Enjoy! Welcome to The Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. My guest today is a former belly dancer and current speaker that specializes in empowering women through body movement. Goal setting, visualization, and mirroring are just some of the tools she uses to create inspiring events. Through the art of belly dancing, Celeste has shown women how to connect to their core being. Variety artists, I give you Celeste de Camps. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that great introduction. I'm going to need to use that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write it down for you so you can give it to anybody who's announcing you from now yeah, on. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's just a pleasure to be here. And I have to shout out to Hal Myers for recommending me because I really enjoyed his time with you. That was a great interview. Hal's a great guy. Yeah, he's, re he he's referred me a lot of terrific interviews, and I appreciate it too. Shout out to Hal. Yeah. Okay. Now, you've done a lot of things in your life. Tell me about the Jazz and Blues Club. That was exciting. My brother Stan is a musician. It's, it's really funny because I, I was a belly dancer. I have a brother who's a magician, a sister who's a makeup artist, a nope. musician. <laughs> we said my parents gave birth to a circus. <laughs> Were your parents involved in the performing arts? No, not at all. Father was a stockbroker. Oh, and um, just, and they looked at each other like, what happened? <laughs> you, know, wow. you don't have one child that does a nine to five job. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I don't know but, how that works. In my case too, my dad was in construction and my uh, mom is an accountant. Right, and you're a magician. And I'm a magician. I don't know how that works. <laughs> I don't either. Uh, but my brother Stan is a phenomenal saxophone player. Okay. And he had um, traveled all over performing and everything. And uh, I played drums, but I did that more for fun. Whereas for him, it was his whole life mm. playing music. For me, I, I really enjoyed the drums and it actually came in great when I started belly dancing. But he uh, had this dream of getting off the road and having his own club where yeah. he can really not only showcase himself, but all of the great musicians that he knows so we decided to go in together he was the whole face of it so his name is stan it was called one night stands mm. okay <laughs> and i helped with the managerial part of things i also bartended and waitressed and everything else that had to be done set up bands and do sound and so it was it was a lot of, of work but it was worth it we had the who's who of the jazz world perform. Um, people like Ira Sullivan, Count Basie Big Band. Ooh. Once a month, we had a 20-piece big band that performed. It was an, just an incredible wall of sound. Mm. Billy Cobham, famous drummer, Ed mm -hmm. Kaye, Bob Berg. Oh, my God, we had so many people. We had Clarence Clemens. Oh, yeah. He hosted our blues jam once a month. We had the great blues musician Bobby Rush. Andy Sumner, the guitarist from The Police, um, he was touring and doing and uh, promoting his Jazz Fusion album, and he performed at our club. Mm. So we had uh, an, an, an incredible amount of talent that performed there. So that was really exciting. When we go into a venture like that, we have in our head picturing all these wonderful performers and things, but having a blues club and a bar and restaurant – is it, was it a restaurant? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a lot more than just putting on good entertainment, right? Oh, yeah. It was, I was, I, like I said, I did a lot of the managerial stuff, which I was also the bouncer. Oh. 
because yes, because my brother Stan is a lot bigger and a lot scarier looking than I am. Mm-hmm. And for him to tell somebody, oh, you have a little bit too much to drink, it could start a fight. Right. Whereas if I tell somebody, they would look stupid fighting me. <laughs> So for the most part, for the most part, it worked out. There were a few situations that were that were a little scary. Yeah. <laughs> we had um, we had this great blues band that would come in, the Bent Fender Band, mm-hmm. and they were great. Their crowd, though, were all bikers. Oh. So for that night, it was just it, it looked like a biker convention of some serious Harley Davidson guys that would come in Mm -hmm. the good thing was for them the night would end early so if there were any problems for the most part they they took it to another place oh good that was good but one night a a couple came in and one of our regulars who he was our resident g-man came over to me and he said you know you have to take the knife away from that guy oh no i'm like what what are you talking about and he goes the guy that just sat down He's got a Bowie knife in his back pocket. I said, no, he doesn't. Yeah. I said, he's sitting on a bar stool. And he said, I'm telling you, he can't be in here with that knife. You're yeah. going to have to take it away. Oh. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> so what happened? Yeah, I go over to him. And he's this big guy. I'm like, excuse me, sir, sir, uh-huh. sir. And he won't look at me. Yeah. I go to his wife and I was like, hi. Uh, he can't be in here with that knife. <laughs> and so she shoves her elbow into his rib cage. And she said, did you bring that damn thing in here? And he's like, what? She goes, you said she can't you be in here with it. And I'm like, uh, I'm sorry, sir, but you're going to have to either put the knife in the car. So he stands up and he pulls out a seven inch blade. Oh. And I'm sitting there going, I still don't know how he was sitting on it. <laughs> and he hands it to me and he goes, can you just hold it for me? So I look at our G-man and he goes, yeah, hold it for him. But he can't get it till after he leaves. I said, okay. And sure enough, around midnight, he started getting a little too much to drink sure. and started getting really abusive. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I, I, I walked over to his wife because I thought, I'm not talking to him. And I said, I'm sorry, but you are now going to have to leave. Oh, yeah. And she looks at him and she goes, oh, you ruined everything. And he goes, I'm not leaving without my knife. And I mm-hmm. said, no problem. I will meet you at the door with it. That's right. But luckily, I had her on my side. You know, I made sure everybody was really nice to her all night because I knew she would be my, my in on, on, on controlling him. Oh, yeah. And we know who wears the pants in that family. Yeah. So I thought, you know, I go, everybody, whatever you do, <laughs> just... Make sure she's taken care of, yeah. And so when it came time, you know, she's like, got it. I uh, handed him the knife at the end. And it didn't escalate. I was pretty lucky in, in the fact that I had, we had a great regular crowd. Um, and these guys were actually very protective of me. Mm. So I, I realized uh, a couple on, on a couple of occasions that I had backup when I didn't even realize I had it one gentleman who wanted to give me a hard time and my back was to the bar and I said, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to leave. You know, I really don't want to call the police, but you're going to have to leave. Mm -hmm. And he just looked at me and I thought, I'm going to have a problem. And he goes, shake my hand. Okay. I'll leave. I said, okay. Right. I shake his hand and then he just like stands there frozen And then finally turns around and leaves. And I was like, oh, thank God. (laughs) And I look at the bartender. I'm like, well, look at that. Look how well I took care of that. And she goes, really? She goes, you want me to tell you what happened? When he said, shake my hand, every man in this bar stood up. (laughs) (laughs) And they just about dared him to try something. And I was like, oh, awesome. (laughs) I had backup. I had no idea. That's great. But I didn't know that because my back was to the bar. I had no idea. Then she goes, no, every every man in here, from the restaurant area to the bar, she goes, I thought even the band was going to stop playing. (laughs) They were all (laughs) focused on that. And I was like, well, yeah. So, I mean, we were were lucky in that respect. Well, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about your belly dancing career. Okay. Yeah. Yay. Belly dancing, it's kind of like comedy in that, 
I know what it is when I see it, but I couldn't define it. So could you define belly dancing for me? It is the most natural way for a woman to move. It okay. is considered the oldest dance form in our human history. Mm -hmm. There have been enough archeological finds supporting that. And they've been able to trace belly dancing, uh, influencing Polynesian dancing, flamenco dancing, mm -hmm. um, modern dance, every, you know, and everything in between. And how did you get involved in that? It was just kind of a fluke. I was working at, uh, in college uh, as a cocktail waitress for uh, an old blues club that was there for many, many years in South Florida called Tobacco Road. Mm -hmm. I was cocktail waitressing there and I would cocktail on the jam nights. People would be able to get up and play. So at the end of my shift, I would, I would be able to go up and play drums. Yeah. And I've always liked dancing. And sometimes the bartender would go to me and he said, listen, we need to liven things up. Get up there with the band and start dancing. <laughs> okay. And then get back to serving drinks. I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, up and dance. <laughs> then everybody would want drinks from me. It was great. <laughs> and it increased your tips probably. It increased my tips, yeah. <laughs> and he just thought it was the funniest thing. You know, just go, go up there and dance. So you were just dancing on a whim? What yeah. brought you from there to being a professional belly dancer? A woman, a singer, came up to me and she said, you know, you move a lot like a belly dancer. And I said, really? And she goes, have you taken lessons? I said, no. And she goes, well, you could think about it. She said, I do singing telegrams oh. for extra money. And at that time, this is the 80s, mm -hmm. and novelty telegrams were all the rage. I don't, do you know what that is? Oh, yeah. In fact, I had one of the top singing telegram people, Carmen Telez from L.A., here on the podcast. Oh, okay. So I absolutely know what they are and they're fun, quick, mm -hmm. good money. Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. And she knew that I was there just to help pay for college. And she said, it's a lot easier than cocktail waitressing. I'll tell you that. Yeah. She said, think about it. Let me know. I can get you an audition. Oh, I was, I was attending university of Miami and I was going back to campus that night and on a big bulletin board said, belly dancing classes at Alibaba's oh. every Thursday night. <laughs> oh, this uh -huh. is, well, let me just go check this out. Yeah. I went and later the teacher pulled me off to the side and she said, so where have you danced before? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, this is my first class. And she said, I know with me, but who have you taken from before? And I said, nobody, you know, I've never done this before. And she said, huh? She said, because you pretty much followed along without any problem at all. Oh. She said, are you here just for exercise or what do you want to do? And I said, well, uh, a friend of mine can get me an audition doing novelty telegrams. Uh -huh. And she just rolled her eyes and she said, yeah, just go ahead and do that. <laughs> and I said, well, I want to learn. She goes, no, you know enough to do novelty telegrams. Oh, yeah. Said, but I tell you what, if you are or do decide to be serious about it, I will give you lessons. Mm. And I found out later that her, her name is uh, Princess Scheherazade, okay. was one of the top dancers in South Florida. I mean, uh -huh. she was, had performed all over the world. She was very well known, you know, from nightclubs to musicians. She knew everybody. And I didn't realize just how lucky I was to have her as my teacher. Uh -huh. Yeah, really, after a couple of classes I was, uh, of dance classes, I started doing telegrams and then I kept taking private lessons from her mm -hmm. and then after doing that for about a year uh, I was told that a Greek restaurant was auditioning dancers oh. so she said you know go for it she said even if you don't get it she said you'll at least start getting experience dancing with a band Mm -hmm. and, and understanding what that entails because you don't rehearse with the band ever <laughs> you just oh. have to really listen to what they're doing and if the band knows that you're listening to them, then they will watch you and they will follow you. So it, it becomes very symbiotic. Okay. So it's sort of an improv of dance. Oh, it's very improv. Yeah. Yeah. There was always a pattern though. You always do like entrance music. Then they would slow it down to do veil work and then pick it up to do um, more of a uh, medium to fast tempo. That would go into then floor work. 
and then that would go into a drum solo, mm -hmm. and then it would be going out to getting people in the audience to dance, and then you end it. So, but there were all these different signals that you give each other to go from one to the other. And you probably figure out what works best, what, what isn't working. So you mm -hmm. take out things that aren't working and, right. and you increase the things that are working, right? Yeah, it was constantly evolving. I got the job. I had a place that I was dancing regularly. Oh, that it became a full on show for me. Oh. It wasn't just these, you know, quick 10 minute shows in and out of a, of a house or an office building. It was a whole stage show. Oh, yeah. With a band and singers and, it, you know, that's where I really started dancing. That's when I really started to learn. And then I started taking from other dancers to have a really well-rounded dance style so that I could dance in the Turkish clubs, the Egyptian clubs, the Arabic clubs, the Israeli clubs, the Persian clubs, wow. the Moroccan clubs. At that time, there were, there were a lot of clubs and they all had bands. And it was a really great time. I miss that time because it doesn't really exist so much now. It's very few places have a band and, and very few places actually have a stage. Are there other folks that influenced you over the years? Yeah, I was actually really lucky to meet some amazing people who helped me in different steps of my career. But probably the one person who has uh, been a mainstay in my life for probably 25 years is my very good friend, Don Gwynn, who became my dance partner. Oh. Yeah, it was really, we met each other in the nightclub. She was uh, doing one show and I was doing the next. We started talking and, you know, she was asking me about different teachers that I've taken from and telling me some of the things that she does in her classes. And I started taking lessons from her and learning so much. And I can do all of the different props, the cane, sword, double veil, balancing uh, lit oil lamps on a tray on my head <laughs> that all came from her. We had a great rapport on the stage as well as off, and we became very, very good friends. We decided to see what we can do in terms of going to the nightclubs. Usually they would have you there for two shows. Mm -hmm. And we decided, you know what, maybe while I'm at the Arabic restaurant doing the first show and you're at the Greek restaurant doing the first show, that we switch. <laughs> so oh. then I would do the second show at the Arabic club and she would do the second show at the Greek club. And they loved that. They loved the idea that they had two different dancers. That's great. Yeah, so we did a lot of nightclub work that way. And then many times they would ask us to dance together. Mm -hmm. and we did a lot of shows together, those private parties or in the restaurants. And I moved to New York and she moved to Georgia. Oh. And we decided, though, that we would still stay in touch. We made a pact <laughs> and we, <laughs> we talk at least once a week and we see each other at least once a year. And the reason I, I bring this up is because I found – throughout the different experiences in my life that friends are so important. And I started talking about that in my lectures because we do get caught up in our life and many times our friendships fall by the wayside. So many studies have come out showing that the people who keep and cultivate their friendships are the ones who tend to stay emotionally happy, physically mm -hmm. strong, and mentally lucid, <laughs> even when you get to be very, very old, that it's those people that have those friendships that have that person that they know will always be there for them. Uh, so where did belly dancing take you? Yeah, I was, I was amazed. I performed in Canada for a month, in Toronto and Montreal. I did a show in Vegas. I did a shows in uh, the Turks and Caicos Islands, Belize, Trinidad, the Bahamas. How did all these come about? Do you have an agent that you were working with? or No, no. It was all word of mouth. Because I was dancing in the nightclubs, I locked in with a very strong Middle Eastern community there in Florida. Oh. And once you are in with them, you are family. Oh. It didn't matter 
what was going on. If it was a birthday, a wedding, a bar mitzvah, it was traditional to have a belly dancer there. Okay. So they hired me on a regular basis and they would get calls. People would say to them, I'm thinking about going to um, Turkey to get a belly dancer because I'm just opening up a Turkish club called the Prestancia in Turks and Caicos Islands. What contacts do you have in Turkey? And they would say, oh, no, don't do that. Just go to Florida. We're going to give you the name of our belly dancer. <laughs> just talk to Celeste. <laughs> yeah, they call her. That's who you want. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So, that, so they hooked me up on a regular basis for shows like that. I mean, once I was doing that, I wasn't doing the telegrams anymore. And that was all through agents. So there was a lot of different telegram agencies that I worked for. Mm -hmm. When I graduated, I had five call me in one day. Oh, wow. To work for them. So that, that, was, that was good money for a, for a good amount of time. But when I started working in the clubs and able to hand out my own card, then I was able to charge what I wanted to. And so I dropped all of the agencies and, and really worked for myself. And when you're traveling different countries, you're charging a lot more. Yeah. And it, and it was, and it was great, uh, you know, because they would, I mean, Turks and Caicos had me for six weeks. Oh, nice. That was a lot of fun. Tell me about performing with Robert Plant, a hero of mine from Led Zeppelin. Oh, yeah. That was crazy. It was funny because when I was in my dorm room, I didn't have Middle Eastern music. It wasn't, it's not as accessible as, as it is now. Yeah. But being a drummer, I loved Bonham solos. Right. So I thought, you know what? The closest I have to time changes were listening to Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. and specifically things that Bonham would do. Okay. So I studied that music for a long time, and I, I get a call from my chiropractor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she calls me yeah. up and she said, um, Zeppelin, which is Robert Plant of Led Zeppelin. I'm like, yeah, I know who he is. And there she goes, yeah. um. Maybe. She said, well, he's putting in some Middle Eastern music in his band i said yeah it's called no quarter and she goes oh you already know about it and i said yeah she goes great because they want a belly dancer for their performance that they're doing and that they, you know they're coming here in florida and as it turned out it was the band's idea oh. they wanted to surprise robert plant okay <laughs> apparently apparently he was at disney world and saw a belly dancer and he goes oh my god we need a belly dancer in our show <laughs> And the band was talking to her about it. She goes, I know a belly dancer. And she's great. She goes, get her. Mm -hmm. So I get a call, and I, I already had tickets to see the show. Yeah. And oh. they said, okay, fine. They go, bring your costume. What's your seat number? We will come and get you. So I'm standing there with my garment bag and everything with me. And they came up, and they're like, Celeste? I said, yeah. So while the um, Black Crows were on, oh. They took me backstage and they said, okay, here's the deal. Said Robert Plant introduces his song and while he's setting it up, we're going to have you come out. He does not know you're here. He said, we want you to drop a veil on him and the two guitar players. Yeah. And then we'll let you know when you're done. I was like, okay, cool. And yeah. they go, oh, one more thing. Don't let him grab you. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they go, we, we're pretty sure you know how to do that. And I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> I really like him, but okay. Um, I'll be professional. The, the music starts, and I'm in the wings. I'm already in my costume. And he's leaning back. And as he's leaning back, they push me out on stage. Well, the whole place just stands up on their feet and yell and scream. And he was like, oh, yeah, they're loving this. So he leans back even further. Oh. And then in the corner of his eye, he sees me and he's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> they, thought the they thought they were yelling and screaming for him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's big smiles on his face. And he's like, yeah, this is part of the show. Now, I'm dancing, and I put a veil around him. I go to the bass player, put a veil on him, mm -hmm. and I dance over to the guitar player who just stops playing. He goes, I'm just going to enjoy this. <laughs> <laughs> and I was surprised they had me out there pretty much for, I mean, for the whole song. I thought it was going to be five seconds on and off, but oh. no, I was out there. And, and my brother, my younger brother who was with me, 
He said it was so funny. He said he went to grab you and you just twirled right out of his hands. <laughs> and I said, well, I was told he wasn't, you know, not to let him grab me. <laughs> it's like you've done it before. Yeah, you know. So uh, he goes, well, it looked really slick. It looked really good. Uh, and the manager came over to me and, and they're like, well, the whole band wants to meet you afterwards. So can you stick around? And I'm like, oh, well, God, if I have to. <laughs> yeah, it's Led Zeppelin. Sure, yeah. all right. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah. So I got to meet everybody afterwards and they were really nice. And, and Robert Plant comes over and he kisses me on both cheeks. And he said, that was so amazing. No. I said, were you surprised? He said, that was the best surprise ever. He goes, I can't believe you. He goes, you know this music. And I said, oh, I've been doing it for a while. Yeah. So it, yeah, that, that was a huge thrill. It couldn't have been nicer. It was, you know, one of those things, you know, you're always afraid to meet your idols and, and be disappointed. But no, he was, he was a complete gentleman. His whole band was. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. They were all great. What a great memory. Yeah. <laughs> so what took you from belly dancing to speaking, the thing you're doing now, currently? Oh, when I, I moved to New York, I, I was still doing some dancing. And then I got a job selling wine and spirits to restaurants and hotels for a big distributor. I did that for many years. And I just noticed that a lot of the things that I had learned when I was dancing and teaching women to dance and working in the restaurant, and I realized that a lot of the confidence that I felt all translated into my everyday life. And, it's, and it, I realized how much it helped me in sales. Mm. And many times they would ask me to work with people as you know, they were new salespeople to show them the ropes. And I actually had a lot of young women that I would be mentoring and helping. And I started to tell them, I said, you know, you can't just shyly walk into a place. I said, these are noisy restaurants and bars. You have to let your presence be known. You need to walk in there like you own the place yeah. for people to pay attention to you, to take you seriously, and you need to establish eye contact. Mm -hmm. You need to talk in a professional voice. You have to know your product. You have to know what you're selling. And it was a lot of these things that I realized over the years that I had been doing, you know, that I felt came naturally to me and realized, no, this was something I, I had to work on. Mm. These were a lot of techniques and things that I had to learn for myself because I was very shy in school, except when it came to dancing. When I was dancing, I felt completely in control and I felt powerful. Mm -hmm. And I think that the years of performing and dancing, that that confidence creeped into my everyday life. And I realized that a lot of that shyness went away, that I would walk into rooms as if I was walking onto to the stage. Yeah, it seems like, like we do have two kind of personas. We have the average everyday persona that we put across when we're just talking to somebody. Mm -hmm. And then we have our stage persona, mm -hmm. which is always, or to me it is anyway, always more confident and stronger and you feel better about yourself when you're on yes. stage, right? Yes. So that creeped into your, your personal life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, where I started realizing that I was actually holding eye contact with people, feeling more comfortable and confident, because I realized that that was what I was doing on a regular basis when I was performing in the clubs, and people want to talk to you afterwards. Yeah. That was very difficult for me in the beginning. Because I was so shy, you know, that was what was good about the telegrams. You were in and you were out mm -hmm. and people didn't really have much chance to have a conversation with you. Uh -huh. But in the club where you're there for at least two shows, there's nowhere to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I realized that if I wanted a career doing this, that I had to be more confident in talking to people and not realizing at the time I was networking. Mm. And I was passing out my card and building my business. And I think the more I did that, the more I started to feel like a lot of that self-doubt go away. Uh -huh. And when I started teaching women to dance, I saw how quickly they would transform. 
Uh-huh. And they would be right in front of me. Whereas they were telling me, oh, no, my, my hips don't move <laughs> like that. Okay. I don't move like that. I would like to learn how to move like that. And they were talking themselves out of it. Mm-hmm. And when I started to get them to relax, get them to understand there's no judgment here, that you were danced when you were a kid. This should all come very naturally for you. And as I started to get them into the different poses, that they started to feel really good about themselves. They started to feel sexy. They started to feel beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it was that fast. And then I realized that when I was working with these young women coming into sales, that when I would tell them, hey, put your shoulders back, stand up straight, walk in there with purpose, that they transformed. You know, and after being in sales and doing that for many years, you know, I just got to a point in my life where I wanted to do something that was more meaningful. And I had this idea in my head of helping other women find their confidence Mm -hmm. and get that awful negative voice in our heads to be quiet. Yeah. So little by little, I started doing research because I knew I I couldn't have been the only one who figured this out. Sure. Uh, That if we change our body position, that we changed our mindset. And sure enough, there's a whole body of evidence and research that has been studied from psychiatrists to scientists to researchers in that mind-body connection. Yeah. And little by little, I started to put a lecture together. Mm -hmm. And when I finally had the opportunity to present it, it went over really well. (laughs) I, I, I took a leap of faith. I left the job. And I started putting together lectures. I started working on my own communication skills by going to Toastmasters. Oh, yeah. Uh, I took improv. I, had, I, I actually worked with an improv group. We, mm-hmm. <laughs> we did several performances uh, for over a year. I worked with a great improv coach, um, Chris Griswold, who was amazing. And so I learned a lot there, too, and, and also understanding – how your body position really does affect how your mind works. So if if you were to give somebody some advice on becoming more confident with their body positions or such, when you walk into a room and you don't know anybody there, what are some of the things that you can do to present yourself or feel even more confident? Well, I tell them to start that feeling when they're at home. One of the things that I learned was start moving around. If you're nervous, start dancing or singing or whatever makes you feel good about yourself. I always tell people put on music that you like, mm-hmm. that, that really makes you feel uplifted and shake your body. Get the nerves out and then stand up. I mean, put your shoulders back, get into a confident pose, which means your head is up, your shoulders are back, and stay that way for a couple of minutes at least. Okay. And in fact, scientifically, they showed that just doing a confident pose like that for two minutes, your testosterone level goes up. No. And your cortisol level, the one that our stress hormone, goes down. And that's just in two minutes. We actually do a chemical change when we put ourselves in a confident pose. And I tell people to stand that way. And I said, and I want them to see themselves walking into a room, feeling confident, put a smile on your face. What you want to do is you want to walk in, you want to smile, you want to catch somebody's eye. And as soon as you see a smile back at you, then you walk confidently up to that person and introduce yourself. Mm. That has worked for so many people, you know, when they told me that they were so nervous going into a job interview. And when they see themselves being confident in the job interview, they said they were able to translate that confidence when they were actually there. You're talking a lot about visualization too, right? Not only using body movements, but you're also visualizing yourself in that position. Yes. Yeah, I I would sometimes visualize my whole show before I would do it because it it helped me understand 
what I wanted to accomplish, what I wanted to do. Because as I was doing the belly dancing, I was learning double veil. I was balancing a sword on my head. I, <laughs> yeah. you know, I would uh, do oil lamps, lit oil lamps that I would balance on a tray on my head. Oh and my. it helped me to visualize all of that ahead of time. So when I'm actually doing it, I had already seen myself doing it. Right. It seemed to lock everything into my mind and in my body. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of science behind visualization too. I present that when, when people ask me about doing a course on it, because I think a lot of people hear, oh, you know, visualize it and it'll magically appear. Not realizing that visualization is just giving you the stepping stones of reaching your goal. Mm -hmm of seeing it happen, but also seeing the steps that you need to take to make it happen. Those were those things that I learned, you know, through dancing, through running a nightclub and working with different people in sales, people that I, you know, needed to build solid relationships with. Yeah. When you visualize a end goal, that's all wonderful and everything, but you do need those steps to reach that mm -hmm. goal. And right. visualizing those steps are the ways to get to that goal. Exactly. Yeah, so that's what I would help people with. And you know, when they tell me I'm so nervous, I said, okay, think of it this way. You know, if you were to put on a uniform, like a policeman's uniform, mm -hmm. you can't help but feel like you're an authority figure. I don't know of anybody that could put on a policeman's uniform and slouch. You <laughs> yeah. can't. Put on that authority and Put on a smile because even if you think you're faking a smile, your mind will think, no, we're happy right now. Yeah. That's why when I tell people if they are nervous to move around, to dance, because you can't be sad when you dance. Mm -hmm. you just, I've never seen a sad dancer. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, that'd be extra sad, wouldn't it? Yeah, it'd be just, yeah, it would be. Yeah. And, but there is something to that mind-body connection. Because I think if we wait for our minds to tell us we're confident, I think we end up too much time fighting with ourselves. Mm. I think when you make your body do it, your mind will not argue with you. It will play along. So that's how you feel confident, even if you're not, right? Yes. And, and I know people say, you know, that's something, you know, fake it till you make it. But mm. really, I think we have to not be so fearful of the unknown. I have a few different philosophies, but the one that I always go to is, you know, when an opportunity comes up, I always say yes. Yeah. Because two things will happen. One, that I'm wildly successful and it's awesome and great, uh, and I'll learn a lot. Or two, it'll be a massive failure, but I will still walk away with a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. So I will always win. And I think when you go into situations like that, that no matter what, you're going to win, I think it takes away a lot of fear and a lot of self-doubt. Yeah. And I think that's important when you are working with people because I understand that. I, you know, I had a lot of self-doubt. I had a lot of insecurity and low self-esteem. And mm. I can relate to people with that because I know what it is for myself and to find tools, real tools that will help you through that, I think is invaluable. Well, one of those tools that you're talking about is mirroring. I was watching one of your videos on mirroring. T tell us what mirroring is and, and how to use it in a social situation. Yeah, I learned about mirroring years ago because again, I, I had trouble talking to people and, and connecting with people. And I knew that uh, the key to my success would, would be to find a way to get over it. Mm -hmm. So I started researching and found the mirroring technique. And what that is, is really becoming an active listener. When I meet somebody new, I make sure that I watch how their body language is. And I will, in a very, very subtle way, start to mimic it. So if they're leaning on one side, eventually I will shift my weight to one side. Okay. If they have a habit of putting their hands on their hips when they're making a point, 
when I want to make a point, I will put my hand on my hips. Uh-huh. And there is a very subliminal message there that lets this person know that I am paying attention to them, that we are on the same page. I will do my best to even match their conversation rate. So they're very excited. And they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy that you're here. I'm like, oh my God, I am too. Yeah. You know? yeah. This is going to be fun. Uh, or if they're very laid back, I went, hey, how's it going? I go, it's going well. <laughs> and with you. And, and there is something then that lets that person know that I want to know them. Mm-hmm. There's a, uh, a feeling of empathy that happens. I do put myself in their shoes. And I can tell if somebody is feeling distracted. Uh, I know right away if somebody is getting a little concerned that their attention needs to go elsewhere, I immediately let them off the hook. I'm going, hey, you need to go, and I'm going to let you. And they're like, oh, my God, thank you. <laughs> you know, but they remember that because they'll come back to me and going, oh, yeah, I had, that. I had to take care of that. But where were we? <laughs> and I start to do something where maybe I put my hand on my hip. And when I see them do that, then I realize, okay, now they're mirroring me and we are definitely in, in a bond. Simpatico. We are simpatico, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's, so, it, but it made me slow down. Mm-hmm. It took away a lot of my nervousness because it gave me a focus. Yeah. I stopped worrying about what my hands were doing and trying to keep my voice from shaking. I just listened. You're more interested in what they're doing. So you're not so focused on all the craziness that your brain is going through, right? Right. Yes. And that was a huge help for me. It really helped me to step out of myself and it made me a very good listener. I found that if I take the time to listen to somebody and relate to them to what their concerns are, mm-hmm. that little by little, they then go, oh, and what about you? Right. Because now they're seriously interested in me because they realize that I let them go on and on about themselves. Right. And I asked them questions and we talked. Now all of a sudden they're like, well, hey, let me, let me know you now. And that's what you want. That's, now you can have the start of a relationship. Well, sure. Uh, I teach a parenting class on bully prevention. And one of the things that I teach is a game called Today Was a Good Day. And in this game called Today Was a Good Day, what you do is you tell your child, today was a good day because there was no traffic and I zoomed right to where I needed to be. And then your child says, today was a good day because we had spaghetti for lunch and it was yummy. And then you share something about yourself and they share something about themselves. And it really opens up a good conversation because you're sharing something about yourself. So they willingly share things about themselves. And you feel like there's a real give and take. Right. That's an art unto itself. Mm -hmm. We want to impress. We want somebody to take us seriously. We want people to know we have knowledge. Mm Mm-hmm. But we are then too wrapped up of what we're going to say next and never really hear the other person. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Oh, I was listening. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was sitting here to get all quiet for a second. <laughs> I know there was another question happening there. So. No, that's okay. <laughs> is it fact? Or is it something John just made up? Ah. We are going to move on to fact or something John just made up. Sound like fun, Celeste? Yes. <laughs> okay. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to give you a headline, and you're going to tell me whether it's true or not. And if it is true, tell me a little more about it. Okay. Okay, here we go. First headline. While performing, a monkey came running over, grabbed Celeste's foot, and started sucking on her toe. Yeah, that's true. True. Nobody believes me. (laughs) Because it just sounds so crazy. But yeah, uh, this was uh, at a L'Oreal convention. I was uh, got the the job to perform. And they had a circus theme. It was outside. There were jugglers, stilt walkers. 
a 50s band mm -hmm. and a monkey grinder and his monkey. A monkey grinder, an organ grinder. An organ grinder, I meant, I not a monkey say, grinder. Oh I, my god! I used to say that would have been awful, monkey... right? A monkey grinder. <laughs> <laughs> I used to say monkey grinder too until I, I kind of pictured it in my head. Oh, yes. That's great. Oh yeah, that 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 no, no monkey grinding. It was um an organ grinder and his monkey. Yes. I was so they, they gave me an area and they said, Okay, play your music here and start dancing. So I'm have my music on, I'm dancing, and I got a whole crowd of people around me. And also, I see something flash by my eyes, and I had just stopped to, to do a pose, and I'm waiting for the next song to come on, when I look down, and there's this little monkey, oh. and I don't want to make a sudden movement, because I don't know what he's going to do, and all of a sudden, he just grabs my foot and sticks my big toe in his mouth. Oh. And I'm just standing there. I'm just balanced on one foot, and I don't want to move, because I'm thinking, I'm going to lose a toe. Oh, Yeah. And everybody's frozen. I mean, nobody's moving. And finally, the organ grinder comes running over, and he goes, he doesn't have any teeth. He doesn't have any teeth. Thank goodness. And I go, okay. But the, he is just sucking on my toe. And I said, could you, could you please make him stop? That's, that's so bizarre. <laughs> I don't want to hurt the little monkey. <laughs> and he's, so he finally picks the little monkey, and he lets go of my foot. And everybody's laughing because it was just the silliest thing. And I'm dancing again. My music stops. I'm in a pose. And that monkey grabbed my foot again. Oh, the second time? I mean, we're talking light, lightning fast. I'm like, seriously, guys? And people were falling out laughing. And, and, the, and, they, and the working grinder goes, goes, I don't know how he got away from me. <laughs> Picked the little guy up again. But I was like, going, oh, nobody's going to believe me. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, he really liked my toe. <laughs> That's great. You're going to invite the uh, organ grinder to the next gig, huh? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. We're going to move on to the next one. Okay. Next headline, Celeste accidentally cut her own hair while balancing a sword on her head. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> No, I was always very careful, <laughs> balancing the sword on my head that it would not actually cut me <laughs> or mm. my hair. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, no, that never happened. <laughs> okay. Next headline. Celeste received a midnight call for belly dancing to win a bet. That's true. Oh, what happened there? I get a call at midnight. It's from one of the people that, from the Middle Eastern community that I dance for on a regular basis. What is really funny is that a few months before that phone call, his family moved into a house two doors down from me. Oh. And it was just really funny how we found out that we were neighbors. I'll, I'll, I don't want to go off on a tangent. But anyway, so I got invited to a lot of parties that they paid me for and all I had to do was walk two doors down. Oh perfect. So his name is Marcos and Marcos calls me it's midnight mm -hmm. and he goes Celeste I want you to come and dance for my party. I'm like sure Marcos when now. Oh. I'm like what are you <laughs> talking midnight. about now? Yes come to my house now to dance. I said Marcos you realize I don't just walk around in this belly dancing costume and he goes I will wait for you. We're here all night. Come whenever you want. One, two o'clock, but be here as soon as you can. <laughs> okay? I'm like, sure. Okay. So I got myself ready. It was about one o'clock in the morning. I walk over and I do a show and I see that the place is packed and with a lot of faces that I don't recognize. But I do my show. I'm there for till about two. And I was paid really, really well. And I was like, what? I'm glad I didn't say no to that. Well, that's a nice little surprise, huh? Yes, it was, right? So a few days later, I get a call from another gentleman who's also part of that group. And he's like, so, he goes, uh, you danced for Marcos's party. I said, yeah. It was like last minute thing. And he goes, you have no idea. He said, but luckily you said yes, and you won him a lot of money. 
Oh. And I said, I hope he goes, I hope he shared it with you. I said, no, I actually got paid really well that night. I said, what was the bet? And he said, well, he had out of town visitors and he was bragging to them that he had his own personal belly dancer. And he goes, I could call her anytime. And she comes over to dance for me. Oh. And they said, well, we're having a party now. Where is she? And he goes, I'll call her. And so at that time, we no cell phones. He picked up a landline in another room. He says, I'm going to pick up this receiver. You are to call her. I'm going to listen in. And if you say to her at all that she has to come, that you have a bet or anything like that, yeah. or you have to convince her to come, the bet is off. She has to say yes. And he goes, luckily, you said yes. Thank goodness. So he won a lot of money. And I was like, oh, okay, good. <laughs> but I helped him win a bet. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. I don't think he ever told him. Well, she lives, she lives two doors away, so it's not a, really a problem. Did you, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but did you ever find out how much money he won? No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't ask. <laughs> no, <laughs> I was happy with what I got. So, yeah. All right. Well, that brings us to our next headline then. Here's the next headline. Celeste belly dancing costume cost $20,000. No. Oh. No. no, they do not. No, not ever. <laughs> That's a lot of money to put into a costume that would get beat up on a regular basis. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay, we'll move on right to the next one then. <laughs> Celeste use her belly dancing to escape the jaws of a shark. That's true. Um, I don't know. Maybe belly dancing helped with that, but I think it was just that I was a really good swimmer. <laughs> what, what happened? I was hired to belly dance in Belize. Mm -hmm. The show was at night and I was invited to go for a boat ride. So I was on a boat and we were in the middle of the ocean and it's gorgeous. I mean, the, it's, the water is crystal clear and it's a beautiful day. And I, um, when I lived in Florida, I was an avid scuba diver mm. and snorkeler. I mean, anything to do with water, I was in the water. And so the, the captain said to you, would you like to go snorkeling? I said, I would, but I didn't bring any equipment with me. He says, oh, I've got extra. And I, but I don't want to be rude. I'm a guest. So I said, well, I'll wait and, you know, after somebody or a few people have had a turn. And everybody there on the boat looks at me and they says, no, Mon, we don't get in the water. No. Like, what do you mean you don't get in the water? No, we don't get in the water, Mon. I go, you know, you're surrounded by water. And they're yeah. like, yeah, we don't get in the water. So the captain goes, I'll go with you. And, and I was like, fine. So I took his snorkeling gear and we're swimming around and it's absolutely gorgeous. And he says to me, he said, how far can you dive? And I said, I, I can dive pretty far. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, take a deep breath and follow me. So I took a deep breath, jackknife down, and I see this beautiful coral cave. It's absolutely gorgeous. So he's pointing to me to come down further. So I do. And now I see what he's pointing at. It's a long shark's tail. Oh, no. So I go up. Now, I've been in the water with shark before. And as, as long as you don't bother them, they don't bother you. And so when I get to the surface, he looks at me and he says, what do you think? And I said, well, it's a little shallow, possibly a sand shark. And he goes, I'm thinking nurse. And I said, well, maybe. I said, I really can't tell by her tail. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. And he goes, yeah, let me go check it out. And I'm like, no, oh. please don't. Please <laughs> yeah. don't. Let me just dive down there with a shark. He did. He went down and I tentatively put my face in the water to see what he was doing. And sure enough, he grabbed the shark's tail oh. and she comes shooting out of the cave <gasps> towards me. Oh. And I'm thinking, I've got to dance tonight. I can't be eaten by a shark. <laughs> but that's really not what I'm thinking. I'm thinking I, got, I got business to take care of. I can't be eaten. <laughs> so I hit the surface and I start swimming. And luckily, I, I could see the boat. So I'm swimming as fast as I can to the boat. And now the shark had to have broken surface because now I see everybody up on the boat and they're screaming, swim, swim faster, swim. <laughs> and I get to the side of the boat, but I'm on the wrong side of the boat because the ladder is on the other side. Oh, no. Yeah. And I'm at that point. I think my brain just switched off because I don't know what to do. And all of a sudden I felt myself lifted into the air 
and there were dozens of beautiful brown arms that had just wrapped themselves around my body and pulled me out of the water oh. and dumped me into the boat. And I saw this shark's fin just swim past me. Wow. And I looked at them, and they went, yeah, Mon, we don't get in the water. <laughs> yeah, you think? No. <laughs> oh, gotcha. <laughs> Here's a beer. Thank you. I'm going to need about five of these. <laughs> I'll be relaxing in the boat from now on. No, I never, I mean, I just never experienced that, you know. And really, to this day, I don't know how I got to the boat because I could still see the shark coming right at me. Oh, man. That was the craziest that thing. That is crazy. Crazy story. Yeah, no, I was just glad that they all pulled me out of the yeah, I'm glad they did, too, because yeah. otherwise you wouldn't be here talking to me. No, I don't think so. <laughs> that was Fact Ooh. or Something John Just Made Up. Ah. All right, we're going to move on to our fan questions. You have some fan questions, Celeste. Oh, cool. Okay. Eddie Rice Jr., he's the owner and operator of A Number One Best Events Entertainment, asks, how do we make our bodies dance as we grow older and everything aches and pops when just standing up? Well, the most important thing that we need to do as we get older is to keep moving. Hmm. There have been several studies that have shown that not only does dancing help with keeping you flexible, but it also helps keep your brain working mm. because it's a matter of coordination between your body and your mind mm. and learning new steps is a way to keep your brain stimulated. They said that combination of body and brain is really what helps a lot of people stay strong physically and mentally. Mm. And when it comes to belly dancing, the best part about it is it is a natural way to move. It is I mean, some of the things that I learned to do, I wouldn't necessarily teach because they do take a lot of strength. And I purposely weight train because there are some positions and things that I can hold, and that is due to adding strength training to my exercise. So when I know somebody who doesn't do that, I do tend to keep the, the movements very simple. A great example of that is when I, I was in the Turks and Caicos for that many weeks, a group of women did ask me to teach them while I was there. And I said, well, I could give you a good foundation of belly dancing. And they said, that's fine. And this one elderly woman came over to me and she said, look, I got dragged here by my friends. You seem very nice, but I do not see my body doing this at all. Okay. And I don't want you to have your feelings hurt when I'm just not here next week. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. I said, I'm going to show you some very simple movements that will be very easy for you to do and that you'll actually feel pretty good doing it. And I said, and what I want you to do is I'm going to show you exactly how to do it. I'm going to put your body in those positions. And when you get home tonight, I want you to put on the music that you like, lower the lights, maybe drink a glass of wine and dance using these movements. And just let yourself dance. Mm -hmm. And I said, and if you do not feel good, and if this is too much, then don't show up next week, okay? And, and we'll do that. And she goes, nope, you got a deal. So I worked with her, and I was showing her very simple hip movements. They're called figure eights. Okay. She came every week. She came. Oh. And at the end of it, she goes, can I show you something? I said, by all means. She got up, and she did the most beautiful, perfect figure eights. And she goes, one, I didn't know my body could do this. Two, I didn't know I could ever feel this good about myself. And three, thank you so much. <laughs> I feel amazing. And this was somebody who was worried about aches and pains and not feeling like she could accomplish this. Sure. And so I tell a lot of people, moving is our best defense against getting old and not being able to function. Mm. It's the people who continue to exercise to move, whether it's yoga or Tai Chi or doing Zumba, yeah. you know, whatever it gets you moving. And I know a lot of older people that get into ballroom dancing oh. because it keeps you moving and it's fun. And belly dancing I found is ageless. I danced with the Middle Easterners who grow up with belly dancing yeah. The men and the women, everybody dances, 
And I will tell you, I have seen women that uh, are incredibly graceful and beautiful, and you have no idea how old they are. Wow. Because of it. Yeah. And they'll get up and dance with me, and the smiles are amazing. It does feel good on your body. So I, th- I really believe whether it's you – know, whatever it is, I think dancing is a big key in keeping us feeling good about ourselves. Mm. Yeah, when we're done here, I think I'm going to put on some Led Zeppelin and <laughs> dance my little heart out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> little rubber plant. Yeah, it's fun. As a dedication to this, this interview. All right, we're going to go on to our next fan question. It is okay. actually from a woman out of the UK named Romani, who is a terrific magician out of the UK. She okay. says, she looks fab. Oh, <laughs> that's sweet. It wasn't really a question, but <laughs> I said I look fab. Oh, nice! Thank you. That's what you get. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> All right. Next fan question is from a friend of yours, Hal Myers, aka Damien. Damien, yes. He's an amazing prestidigitator and alumni of the Variety Artist Podcast, episode twenty-nine. Yeah, I listened to it. It was great. It is great, huh? Mm-hmm. He asks. How long did it take you to feel proficient enough to perform in front of an audience? We kind of talked about that a little bit. It's funny because, like I said, that was the one thing that I've always felt good about was dancing. Even mm. when I was a kid, I just always, I always enjoyed it. It always made me feel good. I, for some reason, was never shy when it came to that. And I, I guess now I realize it's because when I was dancing and I was putting myself in these different positions that I felt in complete control. Ah. And that really, that overcame the shyness. It was like, no, the music is on, I'm dancing. And for some reason, really didn't care what people thought. Oh. And I, it was funny because I had a friend in, that I went to college with, and he saw the Zeppelin show not knowing that was me dancing. Mm. He was a bass player, and he had called my brother, the saxophone player, Stan. Yeah. And he said, he goes, hey, he goes, I was just at Robert Plant's concert and they had this belly dancer she was amazing he said, yeah that was celeste he goes yeah that's why i goes i know celeste is belly dancing you should tell her about this girl he goes no that was celeste and that's he goes fair. no celeste is quiet and shy and barely talks that couldn't be her he goes no eh, she's different when she dances <laughs> Well, uh, Hal has a couple of other questions. Do you mind answering them? Sure. Oh, yeah. All right. No problem. When you teach empowerment through movement, utilizing uh, belly dancing, how long does it take the students to embrace and feel comfortable with your techniques? It actually, it's really fast. It's very quickly. I'm not teaching them all how to belly dance. What I'm really teaching them is to be connected to their bodies. And I do that first with breathing exercises. Mm -hmm. which I tell people is great if you're feeling anxious or stressed or you you need a little boost of energy, doing this breathing exercise will help. And so I get people relaxed right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And then I go through a series of movements with rolling your head and your shoulders and your torso and your hips and your knees. So everything gets loosened up. And then they start to feel comfortable within themselves. And then I start to explain about good posture, standing up tall and feeling what that is and remembering that. Mm. And then we walk. I have them from standing to walking. And I actually have them do a lot of different walks. And it's like, you know, walk silly, walk mad, walk like you have the whole world on your shoulders. You know, now I want you to walk as if you can conquer anything. And it's amazing to see how quickly the emotions change. It's fast. And people are like, this is crazy. Hmm. I I felt really upset, and now I feel really good. And I said, that's the power of movement in your body. I tell people, I don't expect you to be happy 24-7. That would be exhausting. Nobody needs to do that. I said, but there are times when we have to be on. Mm-hmm. We have to a set job interview. We have to be at a networking event. We have a presentation we need to do for our clients. We are maybe meeting somebody and it's a first date. And we want to put our best foot forward. So maybe we had a really bad day, but no date or interview wants to hear about it. Yeah. They want to know 
what are you about? And you want to show them the good side of you. And you could cry later. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, you get home and then be upset about your day. But when you are working with people and you're trying to establish relationships, you need to put a lot of that off to the side. And, and it's funny because once you do make yourself do that, you start to even look at your bad day in a whole new perspective. You mm -hmm. thought, you know what? Maybe it was a bad day, but you know what? I pulled it out and yeah. I really feel good about myself. Now, for our listeners, you have a free gift for somebody? Oh, yeah. That's actually for anybody that wants to go to celesticamps.com slash priority. It is 10 ways to make yourself a priority. Mm. I think one of the hardest lessons I had to learn was being able to set boundaries and focus on myself and not feel bad about it. Mm. There was a time that I had to put a lot of effort into family and doing anything for myself. I, I just couldn't see doing. It made me feel terrible. Like I was being selfish. Yeah. It took a long time to realize that if I didn't start taking care of myself, I wasn't going to be able to help the people that needed my help. Uh -huh. I was making myself sick. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. I thought if I continue this way, I'm not going to be any good for anybody. And little by little, I had to learn how to take time for myself and re-energize and refocus and center, be mindful of how I was eating, be mindful of getting sleep, things like that, and not feel bad about it. And realize that the more I took care of myself, the better I was able to, to take care of other people. Yeah, so this free gift will teach people how to do that. Yeah, it's 10 steps. I don't think anybody should get overwhelmed with it. I tell people you're not going to do all 10 in one day. Don't even try. But it's ideas. Maybe today you decide, I am going to go to that class that I've been putting off. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think today I'm going to tell everybody, no, going to go do this. You know, I'm going to take an hour for myself and do this because I, I need to, I, I want to, and be okay with it. I'm, I'm giving everybody permission <laughs> to make themselves a priority and realize that that's very important. Now, here's something you may not know is uh, last night when I was doing all this research, I went ahead and ordered that free gift for myself. Oh, you did. <laughs> and it's on my computer. I looked at it and the neat thing about it is they're small little bite size paragraphs telling you uh, kind of what you can do to get out of that funk and to treat yourself. And it feels great. I, I read oh. over the whole thing last night in one short sitting. Oh, yeah. Well, that was the idea. Yes. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. The idea was just, you know, maybe you have a little voice in your head that says, you know, take some time to breathe. Well, what do you call it? It's a free gift. It's a free gift. Yeah. Yeah. yeah order yeah. that free gift because then you'll find a little bit more about what's less about and the things you can do for yourself mm -hmm. to give yourself a better life. Yeah. Well, thanks Celeste for doing my show and thank you for making me feel good. <laughs> Where can someone get a hold of you for either a speaking engagement or something like that? Well, speaking, that's because that's really what I do now. They just go to my website. It's easy, celestedecamps.com. Well, perfect. Thank you once again, Celeste. You are so awesome. Well, thank you, John. This is great fun. I really appreciate this. This was great fun. <laughs> and thanks to all my variety artists. If you found this podcast valuable, tell a friend. That's how we can spread the word. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist, but your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist, but until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.